Welcome back, my friends, to the show with my friends. All right. Welcome back, quizzers. And now we have, for this year, we're getting into Hebrews. So here's an introduction to Hebrews. And we're hoping you can hang into that for the rest of the year. Hanging, yeah. Hanging. There. Hang gliding. Your hanging will definitely be encouraged by this year's study of Hebrews, which some unsung author was commissioned to write. Yes. And then the loudly crowing Peter will finish this quizzing year off, uh, writing on the actual Great Commission. Yeah, so hang in there for that controversial surprise, huh? Now, as you might have guessed, our theme for Hebrews will be hanging in there, since it seems the author of our Hebrews is pretty insistent that his he, his readers hang in there. It might even be considered our author's primary theme. So let's spin our titles around that hanging theme, which is how I spun Hebrews eight years ago, last time I did this in quizzing. And I don't expect my impression of the primary theme to be any different this time. And this time, though, I have a much more recent commentary to appeal to, a 2015 commentary by Tom Schreiner. Yeah, according to a pretty good source, a scholar that we're hoping to have at our church in the near future, hoping to have at a corpus conference either next year or the year after that. Now, Tom is a person that I saw quite a while back, a, a person that I saw joining forces with, with John Piper, Wayne Grudem, and and uh, Moo, yeah, that Moo, back in O2, yeah, joining forces with them to kick a couple of liberal butts out of a most prestigious club, uh, a theology club that was formed by Roger Nicole. And, yeah, I was at one of his sessions at the time, and it was formed by him long before I was born. It was formed on the basis that God would hang in there, would hang in there with his inerrant word formed on the basis that God was all-knowing, and that therefore his word was inerrant and infallible, yeah. formed on the basis that God would never, ever repent or relent of his word, despite wonky interpretations by liberals to the contrary, for example, in Jonah. right? But unfortunately, those wonky liberals won the day we can hear in that highly anticipated vote in the O2 ETS conference in Toronto, with uh, bleeding heart sympathizers rejecting the expulsion of those limp wristed liberals from the club. A conference which soured me not only on Clark Pinnock, yeah, I was at one of his sessions there too, Sanders and Boyd, but on William Lane Craig as well. Yeah, it soured me on William Lane Craig, who voiced equally limp thoughts at a parallel session. William Lane, who was president of the American Philosophical Society at the time, he voiced a passionate defense of those liberals at that conference, and he voted to retain those believers in an awfully lame God. Yet William Lane must have thought he was just being reasonable or something. So much for a, a biblical God of an infinity and beyond. Yeah, right. That's a poke at his kale apologetic. Which I admit is a pretty lame segue to another commentator who we'll be referring to frequently this year. A man by the name of William L. Lane, whose middle initial definitely does not stand for liberal, and whose God is not nearly as lame. A classic conservative commentary, the gold standard. It was considered to be the very best commentary. Well, let's show you. There is the very best commentary. Yep. Okay, you got that? Yeah, very best commentary by most submitted reviews. An extensive commentary, I tell you. That was published way back in 91, and it took a whole 12 years to write, understandably so, with the slightly shorter but much more recent Shriner commentary coming in at number 18 with a bullet. Yep, and my runaway favorite. 
So it seems you will be getting both the best and the latest scholarship on the Epistle of Hebrews in this go-round, though I was quite content with the previous go-round. An epistle widely considered to be the second most important epistle in the entire New Testament. Considered second most important to well, Romans, of course, by, by John Owen the Lesser. Uh, John Owen the Greater is ranked number 12 right now. A 19th century John Owen who wrote the introduction to a marvelous translation of John Calvin's commentary on Hebrews. Yeah, you want to see that one? Look at that. There. He wrote the the intro to that one. Yeah, on and on. Cheo, there he is. Um, and that's another significant commentary that we'll be considering uh, very closely, even though it does not appear in the recent top hundred. Maybe just because it's free or too ancient. As we have seen earlier. All too often we ignore Calvin's dusty and practical gems to our great undoing. Gems which are brazenly unpolished and unapologetic. Now, as a matter of helpful church, church history for you quizzers, this John Owen the Lesser also mentioned early on in that 1853 intro about how furious he was with the idle, liberal scholarship of the time. He was furious with the German scholarship that was severely trifling this epistle and trashing scripture in general at the time. A liberal trashing academically promoted at the German University of Tübingen by a professor ironically named F. Christian Bauer. F. Christian Bauer, who is not to be confused with the far more wonky Bruno Bauer around the very same time. Bruno was a far more radical and far more influential German who was not a professor, but just a speculative writer and full-time tobacco salesman. Bruno was crazy influential, in fact, much like the speculative Dan Brown of our present times. Dan Brown, who is merely a fiction writer with a psychotic liking of codes and conspiracy theories, who is an opportunist selling broken clocks to cuckoos. Yet, unfortunately, this academic F. Christian went sideways and became a slave to the allegedly higher skepticism of Schleiermacher, an allegedly more scientific German. Then, our slavish F. Christian did a wild 180-degree turn and tripped really far out to left field with mysticism. The mysticism of yet another popular German and fellow YouTuber named George Hegel. Yes, George, well, D. With F. Christian then reconstructing his perception of valid Christian dogma on Curious George's hyper Hegelian terms. Hence, a Hegelian hell of a dogma, which was a totally invalid way to do history, let alone theology. An utterly psychotic way learned from the very founder of psychoanalysis, according to the famed French philosopher and psychologist Maurice Ponty. It was learned from an intentionally obtuse writer who could dull the minds of the very finest, according to Hegel's contemporaries Kaufman and Schopenhauer. So it seems that the formerly scientific F. Christian was properly dulled by Hegel. And it was given, and he was given to pure speculation instead, as was the more sketchy Bruno. A sketchy mindset. Oh, yeah, there's a picture of him. I got that book out of uh, King's College here in town. A sketchy mindset, which is affirmed by the historian Philip Schaff, wonderful historian, who was, <laughs> incidentally, I just got 50,000 pages of his for five bucks, Kindle, wow, who was, look out, who was schooled by F. Christian at that very same time, at that very same U of Tube, yeah. And this 
mindset was affirmed in an 1885 book of his that I'm currently reading called The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. Ooh, a book where the Swiss Schaff states, In Germany and on the continent in general, theology was predominantly scientific and speculative in character. Whereas in England, and especially in America, theology was far more practical and properly applied to church life. Which is to say that in Germany and on the, in, on the continent in general, theology was essentially more gnostic, gnostic than Crostic. They thought that theology is all about some esoteric knowledge rather than some practical knowledge about the cross, an actual wooden cross as applied to you. Yet this improper and impractical teaching by Professor Bauer was soon to be sent down through the YouTube YouTube with the providential discovery of the actual teaching of the twelve disciples. A first century proper and practical teaching. An enormous discovery, which was then promoted and marketed by Professor Funk from that very same U of Tube in 1878. Now, how's that for irony? To put things into perspective, that is similar to National Geographic's magazine's constant contradicting of itself on the theory of evolution with radically different dates and paradigms with each successive archaeological discovery, it seems. God has quite the sense of irony, it seems. Yes, even if it doesn't lead to genuine repentance. Well, it didn't for the U of Tube then, and it doesn't for the U of Tube now. They continue to be an enigma wrapped in a conundrum. And we continue to suffer from their alleged higher criticism to this very day. For example, compare uh, U of Tube's latest evolutionary paradigm to their previous evolutionary paradigm. Check this out. Here we've got, where'd you go? There we are. Skull fragment that we just found recently. This was posted, what, two months ago? Look at that. 210,000 years old. Brody's skull fragment. Now I'll check out the previous uh, claim from U of Tube. Here we got U of Tube again. Skull fragment, 7.2 million years old. Well, what do you know? What are you going to believe here? Contradiction, contradiction. Incidentally, this extremely practical teaching of the Twelve Apostles was discovered in the Jerusalem Monastery of Constantinople, discovered in a city now known as Istanbul in Turkey, discovered by its caretaker way back in 1873, discovered in a dark and dingy small stone chamber, which was understandably rarely entered, a leather-bound volume that was overlooked by numerous scholars previously, including a prime librarian from jolly old England, Oxford, no less. It is an undisputed first-rate teaching that appears to have gathered dust ever since it was copied verbatim back in 1056 AD, copied from an original, it seems what used to be called a reasonable facsimile before our pampered invention of fax machines and photocopiers. Here's uh, this copy. Fantastic quality. Fantastic. A first century teaching that speaks to a schism. A teaching copied just two years after the great schism occurred. A schism which separated Rome from Constantinople, which separated Latin Catholics from Greek 
Orthodox Christians, a chasm of schism that will never, ever be bridged, according to Schaff. It was copied a mere two years after Pope Leo IX went on a hissy fit over various issues, declaring them as totally essential issues, non-essential issues, such as the real date of Easter or priestly celibacy and naturally the primacy of the Pope. Issues with absolutely zero support from the teaching mentioned above and absolutely zero support from the Bible. A teaching faithfully copied by some obscure scribe named Leon. Copied by some ancient sinner named Leon, to be exact. Which is a long-winded transition to a less ancient sinner named Leon that we will re be referring to. A transition to another fine commentary that we will be considering on Hebrews as well. A commentary by a man named Leon Morris. Leon Lamb Morris, to be exact. A theologian who had, a, who had long been considered the finest commentator on the Epistle to the Romans till recently. However, the late Leon Morris is now superseded by Schreiner and Moon on that epistle as well. So, all in all, we will have a pretty fair representation of the finest of commentaries for you quizzers to consider this year. Faithful commentaries on an epistle with the fewest percentage of textual variants in our entire New Testament. And not for lack of manuscripts either. Which is to say that all the ancient manuscripts read pretty much alike. They are all pretty reasonable facsimiles. But once again, we will not ignore those very few significant variants as presented in a commentary by the great textual critic Philip Comfort. And may you take great comfort in that additional due diligence, huh? Well, haha. -ha. Also, Carson said that in 2013 that there way back in 2013, he said there's another fine commentary to consider out there by O'Brien, but that commentary has since been removed from the market due to plagiarism, and, and we'll make some reference to that one as well. Schreiner picks up on some of his gems. Uh, apparently, there's a little too much borrowing from others without giving them due credit. Now, as suggested last year with Carson, that seems to be a fine line that everyone seems to cross, and it it simply, simply comes with the narrow territory. And it comes with a desire not to multiply words at your expense, not to multiply references over and over. Now, having said all that, I sure hope I'm forgiven by you and all others if I fail to give credit where credit is due. I wouldn't want that to be, you know, I wouldn't want to be accused of bad old plagiarism. No, I'm not accused of illegitimate copying, however accidental it might be. Though that should hardly be a fatal tailspin to some otherwise fine commentary that we might have. A fatal tailspin, like our speculative bower <laughs> went into after he claimed that Jesus never existed. An existence which is rarely disputed nowadays, even by the foremost errancy guru, Bart Ehrman. Or not, or not the fatal tailspin of a reformationed uh, uber scientific schleiermacher when he denied the vicarious atonement of Christ, when he denied that Jesus died in our place to make us one with Him, an essential doctrine, which is very near and dear to the author of our beloved epistle to the Hebrews, which of course begs the nagging question, who is the actual author of our epistle to the Hebrews, right? Now, rather than just saying the utterly unhelpful and grossly inaccurate, God only knows, as third century mega scholar Origen said, let's, let's take a brief look at the options proposed and those leaning to those options. Number one, Paul. Mm. Paul, by 4th century super-scholar Jerome. 
and by the less scholarly Augustine and Owen the Greater. Two, Barnabas. Wow. Schaff considers Barnabas the author of the teaching above. But Tertullian actually suggested Barnabas begin with. Luke. What? Luke. Or 2nd century Clement. Supposedly by 4th century historian Eusebius. And allegedly by Calvin, but I'm not finding that. Silas by Hewitt. Meh. Not likely. Priscilla. Priscilla? Priscilla by the much vaunted von Harnack, who allegedly reformed Tübingen a little bit later. Well, he didn't. Apollos by Martin Luther. What? Martin Luther? Yeah, not the king guy. Martin Luther. William L. Lane. Yes. Schreiner. Yes. Spruill Sr. Yes, to name a few. On and on. Well, to make a long story short, it is almost certainly not Paul, as appalling as that may sound. One, for numerous textual reasons, such as general literary style, as we will be seeing. And two, for internal identification reasons, as we will see in the Hebrews 2, verse 3. And for external dating reasons, since it appears to be written a little past Paul's best before date. But let me just remind you that Paul got pretty fed up with the Hebrews very early on in his ministry. As did they of him. Read that in Acts 13. Whereupon he reconciled to minister exclusively to the Gentiles instead. Yeah, there was a bit of a blip there. A Gentile ministry which... He was later commissioned for by the authoritative Jerusalem Council, as you read in Acts 15. Now, as regards Paul's buddy Barnabas, well, the viable Barnabas was certainly a, a proper Levite priest, but Barney's was from the island of Cyprus. Far too remote to be influential. Not only that, but Barney hung around Paul a whole lot since he was commissioned right along with Paul for the Gentiles. Not only that, but our devout Hebrew Barney lost a bit of cred when he got smoked along with Peter by the Jews in Galatia. Now, as I mentioned in that commentary back then, he, he got smoked as a result of a Hebrew hangover, something the author of Hebrews is steadfastly steadfastly opposed to. So, and sorry Eusebius, but that Hebrew authority is almost certainly not Lucius of Cyrene either. No. Libya is also too far remote from Jerusalem geographically. And not Clement from Alexandria either, since he was far too remote to be accepted by the church chronologically. He was a century later. Those good old boys, they simply don't appear to be set out for the Hebrew task. No, not for the Hebrew task, as we otherwise see in Acts 13. Much more likely Barsabas or Silas, as, as we don't see proposed from Acts 15. But, but their mission trip was pretty truncated too. It was short-lived at in Antioch, at any rate. And their mission was merely to endorse Paul's Gentile mission in Antioch, not a Hebrew mission, with Silas later doing a bit of scribal work for Peter. As we shall see, scribal work addressed to Gentiles, people who were once not a people, who we will all start studying in Peter this year. With the Jerusalem Council headed by the brother of Jesus at the time, being exclusively dedicated to those people who were a people. Dedicated to the Hebrew mission. However, the epistle to the Hebrews doesn't appear to be written by that brotherly James either. Far too sophisticated for James. Quite unlike the book of James, which Luther called a right straw epistle. Now, 
As regards Prissy, well, that distaff speculation, yep, yeah, is especially silly, as is a lot of von Harnack. He didn't believe in miracles or the Gospel of John. As distant and more recent history has shown, sometimes bluff and bluster go an awfully long way, especially when the... you are a sour kraut. Yeah. Or when you are patronizing women. Finally, the rather novel idea of Apollos being the author of Hebrews was actually rather brilliant of the German Martin Luther, according to Schreiner. And indeed, that idea makes perfect sense, since Apollos was the one who was subsequently endorsed after Paul abandoned those Hebrews. After Paul abandoned those blaspheming Hebrews during his first missionary journey to Corinth. It was an enormous endorsement that our meticulous Dr. Luke was exceedingly careful not to neglect. A rather lengthy and rather lofty endorsement of Apollos in Acts 18. An endorsement of Apollos' super powerful Jewish rhetoric which is a speaking style that was developed at the greatest center of education in the world at the time. A speaking style which was developed in his very own hometown of Alexandria, Egypt, which not surprisingly had the greatest library in the world at the time. But more, perhaps more surprisingly too, Alexandria was also the hometown of the largest urban Jewish community in the world at the time. But of far greater significance is that Alexandria is also the hometown of the Septuagint at the time. The most revered book of the time, since it was the Hebrew Old Testament miraculously translated into Greek by 70 Hebrew scholars a couple centuries earlier. A scholarly translation for that enormous mass of Greek-speaking Jews still hanging in Egypt. An extremely scholarly Greek translation from a text a thousand years earlier than the Masoretic text used for our less scholarly King James translation. A Greek translation which not only our Hebrew of Hebrews, yes Paul, was heavily steeped in, but also which the author of Hebrews appears to be heavily steeped in, in our very finest Greek in the entire New Testament. A letter to the Hebrews in Greek. How isn't that ironic, huh? So naturally, a huge endorsement was made when our beloved Apollos was providentially discovered by BNA in Ephesus. Who was that? Paul, Priscilla, Priscilla. And perhaps our scholarly Apollos, Apollos was in Turkey on a tutoring mission, teaching those turkeys proper Greek. Uh, teaching it from a copy of the Septuagint, which he may have had in hand. Or perhaps he was just teaching prospective librarians. After all, Alexandria's very first librarian came from sophisticated Ephesus. But much more likely, Apollos was on a paid mission collecting even more library books for that massive Alexandrian library, where they would typically take the original scribal copy and leave a reasonable facsimile with the owner. A painstakingly long process. A process which got interrupted when our much learned Apollos was immediately sent across the pond to the province of Acacia. Sent to where BPNA had just came from. Sent to where Paul had come from after having been taken to court for alleged blasphemy by those wonky Jews in Corinth. And come from after having seen their their synagogue buddy Sosthenes getting whacked by those hostile Jews in Corinth while the authorities look the other way. 
And despite that, our highly lauded Apollos was strangely commissioned to silence those loudmouthed Jews. Yeah, he probably wouldn't take no for an answer. To silence those troublesome Jews who were strangely ignorant of their very own law and scriptures. Hebrews who were tragically ignorant of the Messiah who was long before prophesied in their scriptures. Most notably prophesied in Isaiah 53, according to our Brooklyn-based youth for Jesus. Now, he was sent to silence those slavish Jews who were trying to enslave the remaining Christians in Corinth with those old-time sacrifices that could never forgive sin. Sacrifices such as ceremonial washings and kosher food and circumcision and fasting and on and on. Sacrifices that did not make their founder of the faith the least bit righteous, as we read in Romans 4. And cannot make you the least bit righteous either. Yet, I doubt that our dear Apollos wrote this rhetorical epistle while he was commissioned up there in Corinth. More likely, this was written when he returned to the more scholarly church in Ephesus. This is a relatively brief letter written by an Egyptian scholar who appeared to be getting kind of homesick for Egypt at this point. Yeah, homesick like a hobbit who had quite enough of this harrowing adventure, wanting to return to Alexandria to write his smarmy memoirs instead, wanting to drop in on those Hebrews on his way back home with <laughs> Timbits in hand. A, a return that likely got truncated. Perhaps written just before Peter and Paul were executed in Rome around 65 AD, but more likely written just a few years later when things were getting really intense for Hebrew Christians. Really intense. In the turbulent years before, Jerusalem was totally reduced to rubble in 70 AD. At which point, the desire to return to Jerusalem and its to its slavish attention to Judaism was radically reduced, as you can imagine. Perhaps written for Hebrew Christians who had been kicked out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius at this point. Kicked out, as were Aquila from Pontus and his Italian wife Priscilla around 49 AD. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces, as we read in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Likely kicked out for accusing people of being dreadful sinners. Well, naturally insulting the vast amount of adulterers and homosexuals and baby killers. And, well, these are all practices mentioned in that ancient teaching there. Insulting them in Rome and elsewhere at the time. Insulting people who refused to admit that they were indeed sinners. Unlike our unsug unsung scribe, Leon the Sinner, he called himself. But much more likely, Hebrews was written for Hebrew Christians, kicked out of turbulent Jerusalem now, kicked out of Jerusalem for being disloyal to the law of Moses, kicked out over the liberating gospel of grace, since nothing is more offensive to Nothing is more offensive to the legalism of Judaism. Hebrew Christians, who may then have migrated to a place about 200k north of Jerusalem now, a refuge in Jordan named Pella. Check out that. Okay. Yeah, Alpha and Omega even on the cross. Huh. A first-rate century refuge for Jerusalem Christians during those Jewish-Roman wars, according to our historian Eusebius. A refuge for Christians who were now getting imprisoned and beaten up everywhere during the nasty reign of Nero and others. Getting beaten to the point of death now, as were those heroes of the faith that we will see listed in Hebrews 11. However, Rome was more than a bit distracted by the defiant city of Jerusalem at this point, so they were relatively safe in Pella, safe from 
Romans at any rate. But, well, this hang glider pilot is not going to play it nearly so safe with you quizzers this year. Instead, I'll be going out on them to try to make this epistle somewhat more personal to you and make it considerably more practical to you. To that end, I am introducing a mascot for your consideration. Ooh, a mascot! A mascot that goes out on a limb and hangs. Oh, where did the mascot go? There's our mascot. Oh, he's hanging up there. Ooh, hanging up there. Okay, a mascot that we will be calling Tom Hangs. Hi, Tom. Partly out of respect for one of our commentators, and partly for comic relief on a very intense topic. Oh yeah, very intense. Ooh. And then, at the risk of being dreadfully wrong, Juan the Sinner will boldly use the name Apollos throughout these devotions, instead of constantly using the author of our epistle as a descriptive. An impersonal and irritating descriptive, which everyone else seems to be using. So, to recap, the emphatic point of our empathetic Apollos is encouraging those wavering Hebrew Christians to hang in there. To hang in Pella, despite the overwhelming desire to return home. Yeah, the overwhelming desire to return home to their unbelieving friends and family back in Jerusalem. Instead, to hang in there for dear life. To hang in there with their newfound faith in Jesus. To hang in there in the new order of Jesus, rather than the old and grossly misunderstood order of Moses, as we read in Hebrews 9.10. To hang in there, even if it means losing their Hebrew life, for the life to come is intimately worth it, if you can hang in there. Mm -hmm.